Lone, thanks for joining us from our studios in Tel Aviv. Coming up in today's newscast, police search the north for the Tel Aviv shooter. An Israeli organization claims Facebook is anti-Israel, and Israeli researchers create a groundbreaking robot. I'm Natasha Kirchak here with the latest news in Israel. Another massive police hunt for the Tel Aviv terrorist Nashat Milham began this morning, this time in an unnamed Israeli Arab town in the north. Milham is wanted for last Friday's attack on a Tel Aviv bar that killed two people and the subsequent murder of a taxi driver in his alleged getaway. Police reportedly didn't find any trace of Milham while searching the homes of his relatives in the north. Milham's family members maintain that they are innocent. There are reports that Milham's father is suspected of aiding his son and speaking with him after the attack, even though he has been supposedly cooperating with the police. Law enforcement are now looking into the possibility that Milham fled to the West Bank. An Arab-Israeli businessman is offering a $10,000 cash reward for any information that helps catch the Tel Aviv shooter, Nashat Milham. Mazan Kak says he's giving out the reward because he cannot allow Milhem to destroy trust in Arab Israelis and security in Israel. The generous merchant says that Arabs and Jews are cousins and that we should view ourselves as one people. Kak is the head of the Merchants Committee in Jerusalem's Old City and a resident of East Jerusalem. He says business in the Old City has dropped 70 percent in the past few months as a result of the surge in terror attacks. In other news, National Security Advisor Yossi Cohen will officially become the 12th Mossad chief today. Cohen will take the reins after a changing of the guard ceremony at the agency's headquarters. He served as deputy Mossad head before he became the Israeli prime minister's advisor in 2013. A farewell was held yesterday for the retiring head of the agency, Tamir Pardo, who was praised for guiding the country through a dangerous period. The Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Yalon has reportedly approved the expansion of the West Bank Etzion settlement block. His OK will allow for the construction of a new settlement in the area. The plot of land is located between Gush Etzion and Hebron and formerly housed a Christian run hospital. If populated, the outpost will help create an Israeli corridor from Jerusalem to Hebron. Critics say this will further complicate chances for a two state solution. Settlements are legal according to Israeli law, but are viewed as illegal by the international community. The Israeli government has repeatedly said that Israel intends to hold on to the West Bank Etzion settlement block in a future peace deal with the Palestinians in exchange for land swaps. Two days ago, a massive earthquake hit northeastern India, destroying homes and lives. The quake also caused widespread damage to the Bene Menashe community, a group who believes it's descended from the ancient Israelite tribe of Menashe. Laura Ben David is a director of marketing of Shave Israel, an organization that helps Jewish people around the world reconnect with their heritage. She joins us with more. Thanks for coming in. My pleasure. Thank you. So can you tell us a little bit about this recent earthquake in India? How is the Bene Menashe community affected? Yeah, it's uh, it's been pretty terrible actually. Um, the earthquake itself was centered in um, Imphal, which is the capital of Manipur, which is in the northeastern India. And it's, um, it, it's, it was a 6.7 on the, the Richter scale, which is a pretty significant earthquake. Um, we have about 7,000 Bene Menashe who are living in the region, most of them in Manipur area. And how is your organization helping uh, these people? I know that you have a new campaign yes. to raise money, correct? Yes. Um, we've been working with the Bene Menashe for as long as the, the organization is existing, about 15 years. Um, we help them with uh, returning to their Jewish roots. They are um, a lost tribe of Menashe. And uh, we help them with making Aliyah, which is what they all want. Now, of course, we, um, we have really jumped in to help them with this emergency. Um, we're, as far as we know, the only Jewish or Israeli organization that are helping, and, and certainly the only ones that are helping specifically with the Bnei Menashe. So how many Bnei Menashe and, and Kaifung Jews have you guys brought to Israel already? Um, we've, there are about 10,000 of Bnei Menashe, and um, we've brought already 3,000 uh, who are settled all over Israel. And in fact, we are um, hoping to bring another 700 this year. They are waiting patiently for the, uh, the, the official uh, okay from the state of Israel. 
Uh, as far as the Kaifeng Jews, um, there are about 1,000, 500 to 1,000 that are, are, are known. And um, we, we brought um, several um, about six years ago, and we are uh, excited that they're, 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 it's going to be restarted, and we have another five uh, young women making Aliyah in the next month or so. And for those uh, that have come to Israel already, where are they living? What, what is life like for them in Israel right now? Um, so for the Bnei Menashe, um, most of them we now um, help settle in, uh, largely in the north, all around the periphery. We have people in Akko and in Upper Nazareth and uh, all areas in the north. Um, we help them settle into communities that are going to accept them, that embrace them, um, work with them, and, uh, and they're thriving. They're really, really doing well. So what other groups of Jews around the world does your organization work with? What is their status? So we work with um, lost and hidden Jews, which is a, kind of a broad uh, concept. Um, we have, again, the Bnei Menashe and, and the Kaifeng Jews, which are from a pretty ancient time um, in terms of the, how long they've been disconnected from the rest of the Jews. But we also work with the um, descendants of the Moranos or Bnei Anusim, um, those who were, um, who were um, sent out of, uh, who, who were, uh, sorry, in uh, Spain and Portugal during the Spanish Inquisition and um, had to convert or, or die, and they basically um, hid their Jewishness, and that Jewishness remained with them for all of these generations, and uh, it's quite incredible. Um, and now these people are suddenly returning, looking to return, so we help them to return to their heritage, um, whatever that means to them. Um, we also work with people who have much more recent, such as those um, from uh, Poland, the descendants of, uh, of the Holocaust survivors who returned to Poland. Not that many did, but those who did hid their Jewishness, um, and for two generations, um, it was completely hidden. It's very anti-Semitic there. And now, suddenly, these people who are dying, um, the, the grandparents so, who have kept the secret all these years, don't want the secret to die with them. I'm telling their children and their grandchildren. And they're turning to us and saying, what do we do with this, this secret that has now come out? So you spoke a little bit about you know, maintaining this, this Judaism, right? Out of curiosity, what is a process uh, you know, that these, these people are going through to kind of reconnect with their Jewish faith. Uh, do they have to convert, you know, especially if they're coming from these lost tribes? Right. So every single situation is different. Um, for example, with the Bnei Menashe, um, who have been lost uh, really from the Jewish people for 2,700 years, from the time of the um, expulsion uh, of the 10 tribes uh, in the Assyrian Empire. Um, so for them, there's no records, there's no real information. The, um, the, the rabbinate, the, the chief rabbinate of Israel, they ruled a number of years ago that these people are um, indeed the seed of the Jewish people and are entitled to, um, you know, as, as, uh, as, as descendants of Jews rather than um, halakhically, legally Jews. So in order to, um, to properly return to the Jewish people, they do a conversion, but they do a fairly easy conversion because they are living as Orthodox Jews, as Torah Jews. So what can people do to donate to, to those in need from the B'nai Menashe community? In yeah, India? so we, um, we set up an emergency campaign. It's a, a juicer campaign. Um, I, I think that they, the link is probably uh, up there. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's really quite urgent. We have people on the ground there in Manipur now um, uh, who are assessing the, the needs. Um, but there are many, many needs. There's been a lot of damage all over. Thank God um, all of the B'nai Menashe are, are physically OK. But, um, but the, the damage is really widespread, and um, we're only just beginning to understand um, what the needs will be, but uh, we know they will be great, and we are going to do everything we can to make sure that they get out of this as quickly as possible. Thanks so much for coming in, Laura. My pleasure. The Knesset has passed a new bill into law, which requires lobbyists to report the companies are representing in Knesset meetings. The new legislation also requires a six-month cooling-off period between working as a parliamentary aide and as a lobbyist. Plus, the law mandates that lobbyists will face sanctions if they fail to say who their client is when speaking to Knesset members. The bill's passage comes just as Justice Minister Ayelet Shaked is attempting to advance controversial legislation that would require non-governmental organizations to report their funding from foreign governments. The NGOs affected by the bill have slammed the legislation as an attempt to silence opponents of the current Israeli government. 
An Israeli NGO is claiming that Facebook is biased against Israel after designing and carrying out a simple test. The Israel Law Center Shurat Adin created two identical Facebook pages, one pro-Israeli and one pro-Palestinian. They then uploaded hateful inciting content to both sites. Check out this video to see what happened. Nitsana Darshar Leitner is a lawyer from the Israel Law Center that created this video. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So let's talk a little bit about this test that your organization just did. How did you come up with the idea? Look, we uh, in Shurat Adin filed a lawsuit against Facebook on behalf of 20,000 Israelis uh, to stop the incitement that's going on on these pages. We uh, witnessed thousands of posts that calling to kill Jews, kill Israelis, and we demand Facebook to stop it right away because it's really steering the whole wave of terrorism going on in recent months. When we collected the evidence, we realized that, it, that Facebook actually has the ability to monitor the assignment and to take it down if they want to. So we created uh, two pages. We wanted to do a test and to see what will happen. Created two pages identical. One called Stop Israelis, one called Stop Palestinians. We posted the same exact posts on both pages. We put the same images on both pages, which is one difference, one against Israelis, one against Palestinians. And after two days, we asked Facebook to take down the pages. What happened was that at the same, at the same moment, Facebook took down the Palestinian page, the one that called to kill Palestinians, but left the page that called to kill Israelis. And here it shows us that Facebook does get involved with the content. The problem is that they choose which one to get involved with. So your group is clearly making a big charge against Facebook here and following what some might view as a simple test. But do you think this is enough to validate your claim or do there need to be more tests? Oh, no, no, no. It's not, it's not going to be the uh, sole evidence that we're going to bring uh, into the case. Uh, we have collecting a lot of um, demands from, posts, uh, from Facebook to take down several posts. Um, we are collecting, and unfortunately there are so many of them, posts that call to stab Jews, like pages that call to stab the Jews, uh, videos that illustrate how to step with a knife, where exactly to hit the person, um, how to twist it, what to put on it, what type of poison to put on the knife before you go and stab, um, where to stand and ambush the Jews. And um, we are going to show posts of the terrorists themselves before they go and stab, saying that we are going to become Shahid. We are uh, about to liberate Al-Aqsa, that it's time to open a third intifada. And then you will see thousands of posts endorsing the act of the terrorist, glorifying it, calling people to follow him. So all this sort of incitement, which we claim is forbidden because even freedom of speech has a limit, and the limit draws when this type of speech creates an imminent and immediate danger, and we know that as a result of this incitement going on in the social media, people are getting killed on the street in Israel. We believe that the court will issue an injunction against Facebook and force them to take down the incitement against killing Israelis. So why is this happening? Is it, are the people behind Facebook, the people working in Facebook offices, anti-Israel? Where is this coming from? You know what? Um, that's a million dollar question. Um, I unfortunately... Uh, can only guess. 
Um, I don't have the mere facts. I really don't know. Um, you know, Facebook is ran uh, not from Israel. The one who's in charge on the content in Israel does not sit in Israel. The office that is responsible for technology or advertisement or the business side of Facebook is the one who sits in Israel. The others sit in um, Ireland. And in Ireland, these people are monitoring the pages and they are responsive for the demand to take down posts. And you figure out from here. From what I understand and from what you've told me now, you guys are actually filing a lawsuit against uh, Facebook. What is the status? Where are you guys at that right now? Uh, well, the lawsuit was filed in the uh, state court in New York and Facebook as for extension, but it's about to file its response in five days to the court. And after the file, the response, we have to write to uh, respond as well. And then there will be a hearing. The court will schedule a time where all the parties will come in front of him and have a hearing. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Nitsana. My pleasure. Okay, so locusts aren't exactly everybody's favorite cuddly animal, but here's a story that will make you look at them in a whole new light. In what sounds like a combination between James Bond and Mission Impossible, Israeli researchers are developing a robot that looks like a locust, and they hope that one day it will replace humans in surveillance or search and rescue operations. Tel Aviv University researchers were inspired by the locust's jumping mechanism and elastic energy storage. So they decided to design a tiny locust robot made from carbon rods, steel springs, and 3D printed plastic. It weighs about 20 grams and is only 10 centimeters long. But the robot can jump a remarkable three and a half meters and is capable of withstanding high accelerations. Unlike drones that can be airborne for up to about 30 minutes, the locust robot is powered by a lithium battery. With its energy efficiency, it can reach up to 1,000 jumps with only one battery loading. The lead developer, Professor Amir Ayali, explains why the robots are so advantageous. They're cheap, they're very easy to, to, to manufacture, you can easily uh, mass product uh, a small jumping robot, and what you do with it is whatever is needed whenever you want to engage uh, any kind of robotic system with no uh, human interference or intervention at all. It could be used in, in, in rescue and, 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 and uh, I mean, oil clean spills, whatever you can, you can come up with. I mean, you can send out dozens, hundreds, even more of these tiny, uh, tiny things, and, and they will, they, they will, I mean, they'll do whatever is needed uh, from them, wherever, where, wherever human can, 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 get or can reach. So is this just science fiction, or is it possible that this locust-type robot could be the future of autonomous surveillance and emergency response systems? Ayali sounds convinced this will be the case one day soon. We are studying the, the swarming capabilities, abilities, mechan mechanisms of locusts. And once we gain enough knowledge, this could be implemented in robotic systems as well, yeah. It's time for our Hebrew word of the day. Following the earthquake in India, there are lots of people in need, and every donation can help. This brings us to tonight's word, Tuma, which means donation in Hebrew. Tuma comes from the infinitive word litrom, which can also mean to donate, contribute, endow, or subscribe. In Judaism, making a charitable donation is one of the holiest deeds a person can do, especially if the donor and recipient don't know each other. Although you may never meet those in need in India, take a moment to learn more at the link below. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tomorrow should be partly cloudy with a high of 72 degrees. The temperature will drop down to 62 on Friday and there will be rain throughout the day. All right, everybody, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.93 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. And don't forget to check out our breaking newscast every morning at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Thanks for watching and we'll see you tomorrow.